Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is an expert on human perception. Dr. Brian Boxer Wachler, MD, has pioneered instruments in vision correction and keratoconus and has published 84 medical articles and has delivered 200 76 scientific presentations. He is the first choice of many doctors for their own eye treatment. He is the medical director of the Boxer Wachler Vision Institute in Beverly Hills and a staff physician at Los Angeles famed Cedars Sinai Medical Center. Yeah, I'm impressed with your resume and also the, the famous names of some of your uh, uh, patients. Uh, doc, uh, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here, John. Happy, happy to be here with you. The book is Perceptual Intelligence The Brain's Secret to Seeing Past Illusion, Misperception, and Self-Deception. And it's a thought-provoking book, a book that you can get, Perceptual Intelligence is a book that you can get on Amazon.com, among any other, many other places that you can access this book. Uh, and I'd like to talk about the content, because I read it cover to cover, and I, I found it uh, enlightening. Let's start with the definition of perceptual intelligence, because I think that's going to be critical to the whole conversation. I think of perceptual intelligence as how we interpret our experiences to better separate fantasy from reality. So in a way, it's like having a built-in BS detector in our heads Mm -hmm. to make better, smarter decisions in our life. And that's not always easy. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things you point out is that we create reality through our own uh, perspective. We, We operate in the world we perceive, not the world of reality. And so PI is something that helps us with that. Definitely, and that's part of it. what makes it so challenging because when we're making decisions and we're trying to assess what's real and not real, we don't realize oftentimes what we bring, such as emotions, such as our cultural backgrounds, how we were raised, religion, even our DNA. And this can lead us to make good decisions, but it can also lead us off the rails or even off a cliff. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the things that uh, one of the questions that you pose in one of the gray boxes, which is always the uh, the very thought provoking within the book, is does the brain make perception or does perception make the brain? And it's a combination because certainly we are perceiving a lot of stimuli on a daily basis, whether we're watching TV or reading things on the Internet or our social media feeds or people are telling us information. So there's a lot that comes in. Our brain has to process that and create perceptions. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, too, there's a chapter on sports, and we discuss what elite athletes do and teams to be successful, and they can create their own reality by their perceptions, by how they visualize, for example, seeing themselves achieving what they want to achieve. And that chapter is not only very powerful for athletes, but for anybody who wants to achieve their goals in life. Because, for example, this visualization technique that I detail step by step in the book, how it's done, is available for anybody to help create their own reality, too, based on how their perceptions are. So. It goes both ways, John. Mm -hmm. But but before we leave sports, let's talk about that just a minute. Do you think that there's a different um, uh, preconceived notion about how a game's going to turn out in New England than there is in, say, Cleveland in in national football? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, in that chapter in sports, we talk about lovable losers as well because when, for example, a team is really – in a drought and they're they're in a slump there's an energy of the thoughts of all the players that becomes as infectious as the flu virus and going into a game if the mindset in a lot of times in these cases are even with professional athletes and elite athletes they're subject to this effect where their perceptual intelligence has been reduced and before they even go to a game a lot of times they've lost just because of the mindset. And it works the other way, too. If you have a winning team, for example, um, New England, like you mentioned, or other teams, and one of my inspirations to write the book was um, Stephen Holcomb, who's my patient and dear friend who had keratoconus. He won an Olympic gold medal after I treated his keratoconus, but 
his team getting ready for that Olympics in 2010 when they won gold in Vancouver, they had such confidence. And a number of teammates also wrote a nice endorsement for the book, too. And they explained, um, especially Kurt Tomasevich, explained that before the Olympics, they had such confidence because they had known how they were been performing through the season that they they weren't cocky, but they had that high level of confidence that they were going to win gold, and that became their reality. And a lot of teams can benefit from that kind of mindset as well. Mm-hmm. While we're talking about the power of the mind, I, I don't want to leave out the self-healing notion. You have Montel Williams' story, but other stories about people being able to think away aches and pains, to think away illnesses. People really underestimate the power of our mind. And when we talk about positive thinking and visualizing yourself getting over an illness or getting over a serious medical condition, or at least just being able to live with it and still thrive and be successful, what our thoughts are, are so important because that goes into our subconscious and that does affect how our body responds. That's been proven with many studies. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if somebody's very negative about, well, I'm never going to get over this, and and they have those self-defeating thoughts, it literally becomes a black hole and festers and gets worse and worse and worse. So we do have power over our conditions. And you you mentioned some of the studies. There's a, a Johns Hopkins study that shows a positive outlook can help decrease the chances of heart attack, even if you have a family history of cardiovascular disease. And the Harvard Medical School studies point to optimism that helps reduce stress and the risk of heart disease and prevents um, problems and further attacks. Uh, people recover from heart surgery miraculously through optimism. That's how powerful this is. I mean, these are, you know, highly respected institutions that have tested this idea and it is effective it makes a difference so it's something people need to pay attention to and the book helps people understand that and how to do it to improve their own health Mm -hmm. talk for just a moment about dark lucid dreams and uh, how that affects us this is fascinating because i even share in there my own example of, of encountering this. Mm -hmm. A dark lucid dream is when we wake up and we believe for maybe a few seconds that what we were dreaming about was so real, it was so palpable that it was something that happened. And that could be you um, feel like you have an intruder in your, your home and you just can't speak, you're so paralyzed with fear. That's an example of, a, of one of these lucid dreams. And I even was talking about when I was reviewing the chapter, I was in a hotel room uh, for a rowing regatta because I still, I still competitively row. And I had woken up and I had thought that there was a stranger in my hotel room who had put his arm on me. And I was, again, paralyzed in fear. And when I woke up, it felt so real. And then a few seconds later, you realize, wait, wait, that, that, was, that was a dream. But mm-hmm. that's, again, <clears throat> understanding, you know, what's real and what's not real. But mm-hmm. our mind has that power to really fool us a lot of times. But the perceptual intelligence is part of uh, people with high PI are more likely to get reasonable about it as opposed to those with low PI. Exactly. Somebody with low perceptual intelligence might really perceive and then become paranoid that there was really somebody in the room. And it would certainly make sense to, you know, have critical thinking skills here, too. That's part of perceptual intelligence is to have well-developed, you know, analytical and, and critical thinking skills and look around the room. Is there, are there any signs of entry um, or forced entry? And that's the way you can verify um, to help ensure that you don't get you know, sucked into a low perceptual intelligence situation. Mm -hmm. We've done a couple of books on near-death experiences, and you talk about that in the book as well, out-of-body experiences and and how PI can help determine what to do with those. This is fascinating because, you know, we obviously have a lot of technology and a lot of science, but still nobody has any definitive proof of what happens after our time here is done. And there are thousands of people. We even discuss one psychiatrist who has um, reports from over 20,000 people in the United States who report they've had near-death experiences. And this is a 
relatively common phenomenon when somebody almost dies or is clinically dead and then comes back because they've been resuscitated or rescued by a medical team. Mm-hmm. And um, people report um, what they've seen in the afterlife, for example. And I might add, though, that um, certainly there are critics, and Woody Allen has a great quote uh, when he says, I don't believe in the afterlife, although I am bringing a change of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But when these people are reporting what they've seen, um, and, and there's some very prominent people. There's even one Harvard-trained neurosurgeon who had clinically died and was resuscitated after um, a, uh, an event um, and reported, like a lot of people, seeing someone who was perceived as an elderly-looking you know, person with the white hair as, as God, the Almighty. And one thing, though, that the psychiatrist had found through a lot of the you know, 20,000 cases is that um, there always seems to be a religious bend compared to what the religion of the person was. Mm-hmm. And there seems to be this cultural influence, though, which brings up the question, is there really a universal afterlife that these people have seen, or is it customized to what their religion is because of the cultural effect on their perception? So we really don't know. I mean, we do know. What we do know is that when someone dies, there's a tremendous amount of electrical activity in the brain, and there's a high level of carbon dioxide in the blood, that certainly can stimulate certain images. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody is brought back and resuscitated, those images then lead to perceptions of what they've seen. And, you know, I I leave the door open in that chapter um, because we just don't know. But I do present both sides um, so that people can at least be informed of the aspects of, you know, near-death experience. Yeah, and I, I found it interesting that a Hindu doesn't see the same things that a Christian does uh, in, in terms of the religious images, but there are some common things like the blinding light, the tunnel, mm-hmm. the life playback, mm-hmm. the old, the deceased relatives. I mean, there are some things that just simply uh, cross over many people's experiences. Exactly, exactly, and that's why, I mean, I even report in the chapter something which I'm very clear about, you know, there's really no scientific explanation for this, which is a Dutch man had died from a cardiac event, a cardiac arrest, and he, during CPR, the nurses took out his dentures and they ended up somewhere and he was finally resuscitated and nobody knew where his dentures were. Well, he said that when he was, you know, in this interim state, when they were bringing him back, he saw from above looking down where they put the dentures and he pointed out to them exactly where they were and all the doctors and nurses were stunned because that's where the dentures were Mm -hmm. so you can't explain that one away for example Mm -hmm. yeah i just think it might be a matter of time john until we develop the technology to be able to measure things like the soul and somebody's um, mind Mm -hmm. you know we, we know there's energy but but we can't measure it it almost is like in the early days when we didn't have the devices to measure ultraviolet or UV rays from the sun. You know, they're invisible, but they're certainly there. And before you could measure them, you couldn't prove it either way. And then finally technology came around, and then you could detect it. So I have a feeling there's going to be a time when we will have the tools to be able to measure and detect a human soul. Mm-hmm. And where do you come down on the, the issue that the mind is not the same as the brain? Well, the brain is the anatomical structure, it's mm-hmm. that three-pound blob that's resting at the top, right? You can analyze it, you can slice it, you can look at it under the microscope, you can CT scan it, you can MRI it. That's the brain. But the mind is that energy, it's that intangible, and we can't... We can indirectly measure it through psychology studies, but we can't actually detect what it's like to be you and what it's like to be me, and that's what the mind is. Mm-hmm. In in the in the chapter on vanity games, you have some interesting discussion about Putin and Trump, but especially Putin, who uh, uh, pulled off some interesting uh, cons, including the where he built the Russian Olympics uh, uh, facilities, and of course. Uh, Kraft's Super Bowl ring was an interesting story, too. 
Yeah, a lot of people don't know about that one, but it's totally true and happened. And that was the whole reason. In, in 2014, I mentioned Stephen Holcomb, the U.S. bobsledder. After he won gold in Vancouver in 2010, I was with him in 2014 for moral support at the Sochi Olympics in Russia. And there I witnessed Stephen, again, after he had overcome his keratoconus, he then won two, well, now they've been upgraded from bronze to silver medals because just recently the Russians, who were the bobsled gold medalists, um, got disqualified because of doping. Mm-hmm. So he won what is now two silver medals in, in Sochi. So I witnessed not only him doing that, but I also witnessed how Vladimir Putin was manipulating the world's perceptions of him versus what he was really doing. And this is a man who has this unbelievable ego and belief of himself to be like a superhero, literally, because he had the um, audacity to take what is basically the climate of northern Florida, which is what Sochi in Russia is, and make the Winter Olympics there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they... He did pull it off, which seemed almost like the impossible. So he has this perception of himself, and also he's manipulated a lot of people in the country's perception of him, too. But on the other hand, you know, this is somebody who used the equivalent of eminent domain to move people who were living in that area to make room for the Olympic stadiums and venues without compensating them. Human rights abuses that were suppressed, and also the mass killing of dogs that were stray dogs um, to just make it seem nice. And when the people came among, you know, afterwards, of course, invading Ukraine. So that really started to show his true colors um, versus the way he was presenting himself during the Sochi Olympics. Mm-hmm. Interesting in the, in the treatment of sports, some of the things you talked about, and I, I, I very much appreciated uh, the hapless Mets who became the Miracle Mets in 69. Uh, but there's also some discussion of, of fanaticism, fan fever, and uh, I think P.I. could help some of those crazy folks on occasion. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with loving sports. I mean, I, I love sports too, but we have to remember the, the word fan comes from the word fanatic. Mm-hmm. And this really explains some extreme fan behavior to the point that if their team wins or loses, you know, we may see riots, we may see violence. Um, you, you know, there's all, always reports and anecdotes that we have seen in the news uh, about this. And the reason is, is because emotions, when they're tied to beliefs, that can really change behavior. You know, in the earlier in the call, you know, I mentioned about emotions, I'd say that's the number one hijacker of perceptual intelligence is when you get emotions that are so strongly involved that they start to override rational thought and behavior, that's when people can run into problems. Mm -hmm. And even in, I mean, there's one example I brought up in extreme case where it was a Colombian soccer team who lost in the World Cup to the U.S. because one of the Colombian players accidentally kicked a goal for the U.S. into their own goal right. and gave the point to the U.S. and that's why they lost. This person back home essentially was assassinated in a sort of mafia-like Goodfellas killing, um, most likely because of a disgruntled fan who uh, was so emotional about that loss. Mm-hmm. And it may have been related to gambling losses, as you pointed out in that too. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. the cartels get involved in that sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I think is important about the the power of, of perceptual uh, intelligence is how we're affected by marketing. Uh, you 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 start a chapter with, "Would you pay twenty eight thousand dollars for a grilled cheese sandwich?" <laughs> and we can get into cat poop coffee as well if we want. But um, <laughs> what what is the story of, of serendipity three there? And then this this grilled cheese sandwich thing people with strong religious beliefs a lot of times will feel they've seen the virgin mary in some pretty unusual places and this is because of a condition called pareidolia which is where we see faces and objects and have you ever looked up in the clouds john and seen a human face at absolutely some point? yeah you bet. yeah we all have well 
people with these strong religious upbringings or just who've developed strong faith later in life, you know, have seen the likes of the Virgin Mary in the skillet burns of a grilled cheese sandwich and believed it and paid $28,000 for it, which actually happened on eBay. Mm-hmm. And But this is not the domain of just the Virgin Mary. There have been a number of Jesus sightings, too. And you might remember the chips Cheetos. Mm-hmm, yes. Yep. So he's been seen on a Cheeto, or Cheezus, if you prefer. <laughs> well, you know, certainly religion contributes to civilization and uh, helps us find some order, but it also has us hold on to notions like this so that we see things that we want to see. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, religion is great because it brings people together and, and creates a community and helps create order. But then in the extreme forms of it, that it can affect people's ability to have more freedom and, and belief of freedom than they would otherwise if it wasn't from them. And so, you know, we've seen it in the early days with how even with sexu- human sexuality, and, um, you know, we talk about even uh, masturbation in the book and how chastity belts were developed in the early 1900s by doctors for young boys because parents, you know, believe that this was bad because of the religious influence, mm-hmm. you know, from King Onan from the Bible. And back in the even 18, late 1800s, Mark Twain gave a talk in Paris making fun of this concept back then because he said this is biologically natural. Mm-hmm. This is, and in fact, we know now from studies that that activity actually reduces the risk of prostate cancer. So it's not a harmful activity. It's actually beneficial because it reduces cancer risk. Fantastic. Okay. Um, reciprocity and how it may hijack our perceptual intelligence, the notion that we feel like we have to return uh, a favor when someone does one for us. Yes, we, we have this inner need psychologically that when we have someone do something nice for us that we want to give back and we feel guilty if we don't. That's the way we've sort of hardwired. Well, salespeople and marketers use this all the time to hijack our perceptual intelligence and influence our behavior. I'll give you an example. If you go to the you know, used car dealership or a car dealership to look at a car, the salesperson doesn't start filling you up with lots of free food and and lots of unlimited coffee refills because he or she feels sorry you look so sleepy. It's because they're giving you something and they're banking that you will feel the need to reciprocate in the form of perhaps a down payment on a car, which also is an important concept of reciprocation because it's not equal in terms of the balance of giving back. So you may have received $10 worth of free goodies and coffee, but putting a few thousand dollars down for a car is obviously not the same, but in terms of the balance sheet, it's still you're giving back and you're reciprocating. And it's not proportional. It doesn't have to be proportional to satisfy that subconscious need. And as long as people are aware of that, and the information in the book does help people have that power to recognize when they're being manipulated by sales and marketing, mm-hmm. then you can be help. Then you can be more bulletproof against these effects and save money when you really don't want to spend it. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to get bulletproof, we also have to look at the halo effect and uh, people who are famous and how we are affected by that. Definitely, and, and with celebrities, they have the halo effect, which is when we admire somebody, we look up to them for an area of their expertise or what they're known for, but then that gives them the ability to use that effect and influence in areas outside of what they're being admired for. So, for example, <clears throat> in, uh, actress Jamie Lee <coughs> Curtis used to do commercials for Activia yogurt. Mm-hmm. The problem was the company's claim of improved digestion was false. So here we had a celebrity in a company hijack the perceptual intelligence of a lot of people who rushed out and bought that yogurt expecting a benefit. And so that's an example of how celebrities can influence us in areas that are outside of what their core uh, area that they're recognized for.
for mm-hmm. and, and uh, waste our money. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. And and you also talk about um, uh, what causes someone to perceive that a comedian is talking too dirty for <laughs> for what's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, comedians, even at the lower level, um, in a little comedy club, while they're on stage, they have that aura of celebrity. And, um, you know, the the idea, the gauge for humor has changed over the years, too, which speaks to how perceptual intelligence in society can change, because Lenny Bruce told this, you know, what was considered a dirty joke. He got arrested for this type of humor. It was like a mother-in-law joke, which went something along the lines of, you know, my um, mother-in-law is responsible for the breakup, my, breakup of my marriage. My wife came home and found us both in bed. <laughs> Now, that's a tame joke these days, but mm-hmm. back when he told that, I believe in the 1960s, you know, he was put in jail for that type of humor. So society's perceptual intelligence changes over time, too. Very good. So uh, I wouldn't want to leave out one of the influences that takes uh, its toll on PI, and that's our sex drive. <laughs> and this is a very popular chapter in the book because... This is something that cuts through gender, cuts through everything in economics of of communities. And this chapter helps people understand when we go back to what's the definition of perceptual intelligence, what's the reality of human sexuality, and what's the fantasy of it. And in some cases, it even addresses the question of, is it okay to fantasize during sex? You know, is that considered cheating? And so... I'm going to leave that one for people to find out in the book Mm -hmm. um, because we're on public radio. Okay. So (laughs) I need to respect that. (laughs) But it's a great chapter. It's an amazing chapter. And as you said, the book's available on Amazon and everywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. And and you do mention the Internet, and one of the ways that uh, uh, people begin their fantasies is the sexual Disneyland of of, uh, Internet porn. True. And in the past... You know, you would go to the drug, uh, the liquor store, and you would see magazines. Well, now everything is available at our fingertips, and it's it has like everything with technology. There's good aspects and bad aspects. Let me just start with the bad. A lot, a lot, almost every teenage boy is watching or has seen internet porn. This, in one respect is bad because this is giving teenage boys and a lot of psychologists have spoken to this point of a false perception of what an interaction, what an intimate interaction with a woman is supposed to be like. And um, this is at a very early age causing a lot of problems with teenage boys in relationships with, uh, with, with girls. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you know, this can have benefits in terms of stimulating relationships that are starting to have problems in their um, sexual lives. So in relationships after over time, um, you know, with life and, and kids and, and other responsibilities and job, a lot of um, intimate relations between couples tanks. So having access to something like this can be stimulating for a relationship. So those are just some of the examples of, you know, the positive and the negative that can come from having porn on the Internet that's so accessible. Here's an area that I'm I'm just sure I'm immune to, but obviously some people are not, because at this London coffee house, people pay about $100 a cup for cat poop (laughs) coffee. That's just beyond my belief system. I just can't. 100% 100% true, John. It's not just in London. It's actually all over the United States now at uh, high-end coffee houses. So it's a coffee called Kopi Luwak, and it sounds pretty exotic, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it is from beans that come from Indonesia, and they fall on the ground, and they're eaten by a special type of cat. Now, the story, the marketing story, is that these beans, and by the way, they pass through the cat undigested, and come out the back end, and somebody in Indonesia picks out the beans and cleans them. You know, that's somebody's job, believe yeah. it or not, but it is. Now, the marketing story is that these cats have a near magical ability to pick out the very best beans, which makes this amazing coffee, and that's why people are paying upwards of $100 a cup for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The reality, though, is that the coffee's good, but it's not going to knock your socks off. 
But this is how marketing, especially when laced with a good story, can hijack your perceptual intelligence and waste your money. Very good. Unfortunately, we're out of time. There's a lot of good chapters we haven't even touched on around fanaticism and cults and uh, gut checks and uh, other things that, that are part of the tools we use to make sure our PI is working properly. We've been talking with uh, Dr. Brian boxer who an uh, MD, who has written a book called Perceptual Intelligence. It's available at bookstores everywhere. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I want to remind our listeners that if you don't catch our regularly scheduled broadcast, you can also catch us on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening.